Welcome back, folks, to the WP Tonic this week in WordPress and SaaS, where we discuss all things that will help the WordPress entrepreneur um, and business owner get build a business of their dreams and get the freedom which hopefully they're looking for for themselves and their family. We have a great friend of the show, a personal friend, a great speaker, insightful, argumentative, but really interesting. We've got the Viking in the house. We've got Malton Rand Hangerson, Senior Staff Instructor at LinkedIn. So, Malton, would you like to quickly introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers and the tribe, the WP tribe in general? I think you did a pretty good job. Uh, my name is Morton. I am a senior staff instructor at LinkedIn Learning. So I make courses about front-end web development, design, and the um, interaction between humans and computers for millions of people around the world. So if you go to LinkedIn and you click on the learning button at the top, you'll uh, type in Morton or something that sounds like Morton, you'll find all my courses. And I want to give a quick tip. Don't get into a Twitter discussion with Morton. He's vicious. Uh, um, <laughs> Don't say uh, stupid things on Twitter and expect well, me to not call you out on it. I don't think Twitter, you, you, you thought they were. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, um, and you've got every right for your opinion. Um, Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself to the new listeners and viewers, Stephen? Yeah, Steven Satter from hustlefish.com. And apparently I need to spend more time on Twitter because I've because I, I missed it. Yeah, right. There <laughs> the, we go. The, the lively discussion. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious how I was put in my place. Uh, um, so um so um what we're gonna be discussing, we're gonna be looking at online learning for e-learning entrepreneurs, educationalists. For anybody interested in where e-learning, online learning is going in the next couple of years, it's going to be a fascinating discussion. Before we get into the meat of our discussion, we're going to go over and you're going to hear a message from my great major sponsor. Be back in a few seconds. We're coming back. So, Morton, we've got a hell of a lot to talk about, and you've got a limited amount of time because you're a busy guy. Um, so let's get stuck in. So, um, obviously, have you observed a couple problems or patterns that a lot of people have when they want to build an online course or they just want, you know, educationists or entrepreneur um around online education are there a couple of patterns a couple of things which a lot of people misunderstand or get wrong um i'd say first of all i just need to like be precise here so i speak for myself here not for the yeah. company i work for etc cetera, etc cetera. caution blah 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 just so that uh the online learning is has been around for decades i mean i used to work for lynda.com which was bought by LinkedIn and uh, Linda pretty much invented that entire space. Uh, the idea of taking what used to be a classroom environment and putting it online so people can watch it on their terms when they want to. Um, it started with DVDs and just like Netflix, it kind of switched over to online. Um, online learning is deceptively challenging because um, one of the like, anyone who's taught in a classroom or anyone who's done any type of teaching, even if it's sitting next to a child or next to a coworker learning something, will know that a lot of learning has to do with feedback. So you show something or instruct something, and then you look at whether or not that is actually catching on. And then based on what happens with the learner, you then alter your path until you get where you want to go. Um, in online learning, there is no such thing because you're talking to someone who will watch what you're doing sometime in the future and you don't know their context um so uh, everyone everyone has the ability to teach someone how to do what they know figuring out how to do that in a way that where you're addressing the concerns that come up in the learner as you're moving forward when the learner isn't there is the big challenge um, and especially doing that when you're a subject matter expert, because so there's this difference between focal and tacit knowledge. And the classic example is um, if you talk to a doctor and they take like a 
chest x-ray or a lower body x-ray or, or um, ultrasound or something of you. And then they say, oh, yes, I see something is going on. If, you, if you've ever been in that situation or you ever find yourself in that situation, you should ask to see what they're seeing. And what you'll see is like a blurry cloud of mess. And then from this blurry mess, they will be able to discern things. Like they'll say, this blurry mess over here is your liver and this is your kidneys and something is off here. And all you're seeing is this blurry mess. Now, if you ask them to explain what they're seeing, they are unlikely to be able to explain it to you. They'll be like, there's something that's not right here, but they can't really point at what's right or wrong or anything. And the reason for that is they have a lot of tacit knowledge, meaning they've seen hundreds or thousands of images like this, and they start noticing patterns, but they're not, it's not focal in their minds what is actually different, so they can't explain it. As you professionalize, as you build skills in any craft, a lot of your base knowledge of the craft becomes tacit. It just becomes built in, things you just do because you know it's right. When you're teaching, you have to somehow know how to lift the tacit knowledge into the front of your mind so, you, so it becomes focal and so that you can explain it. That's part of what happens when you're doing classroom teaching is you say something or you present something and then you can see everyone's eyes glaze over. <laughs> and you're like, okay, that clearly didn't catch on. So there's some part of this I'm missing. And then you can go back and be like, okay, so which one of the 100,000 things I, I tacitly know is it that they need to know to understand this, right? So uh, th this, is, this is the core of the challenge, is figuring out how to do this when you don't get feedback. Uh, all the technical aspects of it have been solved. Like we are now in a world where anyone who has anything to say, all they need is a semi-functioning cell phone and an internet connection. And they can make anything they want. You can put it on TikTok. You can put it on YouTube. You can put it on whatever platform you want. You can build your own CMS with an LMS built in. Like you can do whatever you want with it. The true challenge is making actual quality learning content. And that's something that I struggle with every day because it's not like I've been doing this for 10 or 12 years now. And I still sit most of my time going, uh, is this actually meaningful? Do people actually understand this? Or do I need, is there some part I'm missing or something I'm assuming the learner knows that they may not know? And should I address this on the chance that they don't know it? Or is that a waste of time because everyone knows it? Is this something that is common knowledge or not? Like these are the questions that go through my mind constantly. The, I think like the other aspect of that, like you kind of mentioned it, like the feedback loop, but the doing, like whenever I've been in a physical course, right, there's like mm -hmm. homework assignments or there's something that you have to do and then you have to show up the next day and you have to sit in front of the person that told you to do it and be like, here's what I did or I was lazy and I didn't do it. Um, yeah. But with like online courses, right, you, they have like quizzes or they have things that you're supposed to do, but you there's this element of the personal responsibility or that connection that's not there. So it's so easy, like for me to just go through a course and just watch the videos and be like, all right, check completed that course. I learned all that information. And then a month later I go to do it and I'm like, oh, wait, I did not learn a single yeah. thing. Like there's just so much in that doing that's like a required aspect of uh, learning, I think. So th there's the Netflix problem. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, I have a course that's called JavaScript Essential Training. It's free, by the way. So if anyone's watching this, you can go learn JavaScript for free, uh, at least until the end of the year. Um, and I remember I got an email from someone or a tweet, like somehow someone contacted me and said, I watched your entire course and I didn't learn anything. <laughs> and I'm like, OK. <laughs> Thanks. That, that, that doesn't tell me anything about your learning experience. Can you tell me more? And this person said they had sat down and watched the course in one sitting, like six hours. And I'm like, are you, well, of course you didn't learn anything. That is an unreasonable amount of information to try to process in six hours. Like no one can do that. If I watched that course in one sitting, I would be confused. And I made it because... Yeah. It's so condensed, like every single movie, it's like a four to five minute movie, holds an entire concept in JavaScript. And the assumption is you will watch the movie, then you will sit down and play around with it until it makes sense to you. 
until you're able to figure out like when I do these things, this happened and these are the things that I can't do. And like basically the thing that you do in school, right? When you learn math for the first time. So the teacher tells you how to do addition. And then you do like sheet upon sheet upon sheet of basic addition until you're like, my hand is cramping up and why am I doing this? And it's because you're training that tacit knowledge of how it's supposed to work to the point you're not thinking about it. Your and your education consume, your educational experiences were a bit different than mine. <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> I'm, no, I want to know what John's education. I know. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> well, well, one one point in there, and I don't. Um, you understand in a second. I I have I have a syndrome dyslexia. Uh -huh. um, I was just put in the corner and classified as a subnormal idiot because um, I couldn't do the things which you've just outlined in yeah. a proficient way. Um, but I don't really, I don't, I don't exactly disagree with what you're saying, but I don't really also agree with it. I understand why you're saying it. Because um, I apply it to my own experiences, because I couldn't do the fundamental thing which you've just outlined. You... First of all, uh, I also have dyslexia, but I did not have that experience because for like, fortunate for me and unfortunate for you, we were in different educational environments. And it's terrible that you were treated like that. That should not happen uh, because... It's a rough it might, world. It's it a rough be, world. Though. No, 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 no. It's because we're old. And like 20, 30 years ago, the understanding of learning disabilities, for example, was not what it is today. And the, under, the attitude in the educational system was often, if you don't have certain skills, then you are somehow of lesser value, right? That is a type of thinking that is, still exists in specific uh, political circles and everything else, and is extremely harmful, unfair, and quite frankly, stupid. Because it, it, it discounts people's abilities to do things based on um, whether or not they're able to conform to specific ways of doing things that are normalized, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, like the fact that I, I have severe dyslexia, which means I read at speaking pace. So if someone, when I went to university, we would have like reading assignments for a six, six month term or four month term. Exactly. There were like 5,000 pages. I'm like, there's no way I'm going to read all this. Just there is no way I'm going to read this. So I went to the professor and I'm like, what is it I can omit from the, from the curriculum to finish this? And he's like, no, you can't omit things. And then I just went to the students that were one year above me. And I said, which parts of the books were irrelevant to this class? And they would literally be like, okay, this entire section of the book, we never touch it. And I would sit there and like strike out sections of the curriculum and not read it. And then, of course, when I got to my oral exams, the, the examiner realized they had not read a bunch of the stuff. So he's like, oh, my God, you should fail this class because you didn't read the material. And I'm like, it's unreasonable to make me read materials, like make me read this much because I have a learning disability. Right. I don't. I don't like that term disability when it comes it, to dis it is the official term for it. Well, if you want to disagree with the term disability, you need to have a larger conversation with the We need to get on track because of... Stephen can see where our discussions go. Yeah, but uh, so right, okay. Uh, right. But this is this is kind of like off to the side. Yeah. The point is, um, um, when when you're learning things, one of the key parts of learning anything is repetition. You have to repeat things over and over and over. What we are starting to see just as a society is that people are becoming more and more attuned to this idea that you can see something and do it once and then be perfect at it. And a part of that is because what we're seeing on social media is often the end result of like a decade's worth of training, right? So you see someone who's like, you have this, um, there's this funny blog, uh, which is called like cake disasters or something like that, where you see like, here's an Instagram cake that looks amazing. And then someone tries to do it and it's like, complete disaster and it's hilarious because it's so terrible what you're not realizing is the people who built the original cake may have been doing this for 10 years right and knows all the secrets and don't even know how they know it and, and don't know how to explain all the secrets or just have some intrinsic skill 
that you need to train yourself to. And then what, when people come to that, they go, they try once and they go, I can't do this, so I'm a failure. And then they give up, right? Or they go, okay, I understood this once. I don't need to repeat it. And they don't realize this whole concept of like, no, you actually have to repeat it until it's built in. And um, my personal experience of this um, in, in like the close uh, in the last several years or within the last decade was when I learned to dance. Because I've been working with tech and code for so long that when I look at code, even if I don't know the coding language, I can usually figure out what's going on because I can see like the logic structure of it and I understand pieces and how programming works and all that stuff. So it's very hard for me to, um, to uh, empathize or, or put myself in the shoes of someone who's just learning to code because I have all this background knowledge. But when I started to learn how to dance, I had no background knowledge and I had to very slowly build up my skill. And I had, I got the experience of that weird learning curve, which is you're terrible at something. And then you s quickly pick up some skill and it's significant. And then you get to a point where you realize that what you know is nothing. And your confidence in your skill drops <laughs> below where it was when you started, right? And in the dance school, like now I'm like a gold level dancer. And I see that in all the new students, they come in and they get to a certain point and I can see their confidence in themselves and their frustration is rising to a point where they want to quit. And I have to go in and say, look, the, the fact that you think you are terrible at this, it means that you are learning because you, you've gotten to the point where you realize you have to practice more. You have to like, and when I say practice more, I mean, you have to commit yourself for years to get to the point you need to be or then get to the point you thought you were at. And that applies to all things. You have to do it many, 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 many times. And that's one of the things we can't do in online training. I can't I think, make you do that. Yeah, I think another contributing factor to that, um, like you're saying like TikTok and Instagram and seeing like, you know, you, you get to see all of these like experts, but also like, because the knowledge of the world is at your fingertips, there's times where you can hack the system mm -hmm. and you jump and that like whatever that feedback loop that happened in your brain that's like, wow, I just did this super complex thing um, reinforces this behavior that feels like you should be able to do it for everything. And if you can't do it for everything, that there's something wrong. I uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was working with an older programmer, like in his fifties, um, and, you know, back in the good old days when you had to know everything, like it was like you were thumbing through books or you knew it. Um, yeah. And just the amount of knowledge that was in his head that could just flow to his fingertips was just incredible. Like I would have to Google half of that stuff because like I know there's a function to do this. and I know what it's supposed to do, but I have to look it up to figure out exactly how it does it because I haven't used it in forever. But he, he's just like, no, like I know this stuff because I had to learn it. I had yeah. to memorize it or else coding was incredibly inefficient. Um, and so the moments where it's like, that doesn't work. I can't just Google it and figure it out. I can't just look at a tutorial and go replace, you know, fix something or replace something. Um, it's a very frustrating thing because it feels like I should be able to do that more. You know, that is, uh, that is something that I'm thinking a lot about now because of what's happening in the front end web world with the low code and no code yeah. environments. Um, when I was in high school, ages ago, um, they had just introduced this idea of these graph calculators, you know, the really big calculators that have a screen and you can actually make the calculator draw graphs, graphing calculators, fancy crap. Um, and they were little computers. Um, and uh, it, like we were, I started high school when there was a major reform in school. So they went from no calculators in the classroom to we are going to use these calculators. So all our teachers were like, the calculator is a crutch. And you shouldn't really use it. And they were kind of fighting the curriculum, which and the whole curriculum and all the books and everything were focused on using these calculators. Um, and uh, the debate there was, if you only learn how to do this using a calculator, you don't really learn the skill. And the pushback that we as the students gave and that eventually won out was, you don't need to know the skill because computers do this better. And unless you're like trapped on a boat in a river with no internet or electricity, and you need to calculate how quickly the river is running through a dam on paper, 
like there's no situation where you would actually be in a situation where you wouldn't have access to these tools anymore because the tools are ever present and omnipresent and on the off chance that you don't have access to them there's a book you can reference right um no one's going to like calculate the landing trajectory of a spaceship using paper anymore unless they are forced to right so so building the entire tra training regimen around that just doesn't make any sense especially for high school um that is something that i think applies more and more to coding this idea that everyone must learn how to code makes less and less sense because we are now at a point where the tools that we have available to us are advanced enough that people can get the job done without necessarily knowing how to write the baseline code. And more importantly, the code that we're shipping into the web is already compiled by computers to such an extent that it's effectively not human readable code anyway. So we're already using the tools. And the only difference is either you write the original code yourself or you have a tool write the original code for you. And the skills necessary to write the original code yourself are not required for most of the things that we want to build on the web, right? It used to be that if you didn't know how to write pure, like you know, standards-based HTML, if you didn't know how to write error-free JavaScript, if you didn't know how to write clean and optimal CSS, you would produce output code that was not working properly, was not compiling properly, was, was um, not very performant. The reality is, first of all, you can now write terrible code and it gets compiled out to something that's functional, right? And you have linting tools that will clean it for you. So you don't even have to clean it. You can like literally write incorrect code and the, a tool will fix it for you. Um, but more importantly, there are, uh, there are components and frameworks and extensions that are built to do the majority of that work for you. So instead of saying, I want to build like a card, you say, I'm gonna grab this card component and just configure it, right? And the distance between I'm going to grab a card component in code and configure it, and I'm going to grab this thing in the view and drag it over here and drop it and pick the color is just a matter of interface, right? So in the near future, and I think like within two to five years, the role of the front-end developer, the regular front-end developer will shift from being I write HTML and JavaScript and CSS to I configure some form of low, low code or, or no code environment where I do some coding, but very minimal. And five to 10 years from there, or two to five years from there, the people who write front end code will be laggards like me and people who write the tools that we use in these low code environments. And no one else will write that code. It'll just be that. And the, necess the necessity of learning how to write code will face itself out and become more the necessity of learning how to properly understand how the computer systems work to create these environments, uh, being able to troubleshoot when something goes wrong, but more importantly, being able to use them to build things that are functional and meaningful to the end user. Right? So it's great. a very dramatic shift in how our industry operates. Right, that's great. We need to go for our break and listen to a couple of our great sponsors. We'll be back in a few moments, folks. We're coming back. We've had a bit of a dive. I thought that would happen. We'd be able to get together, but it's been fascinating. So um, you've produced a ton, a ton of courses, lessons. I don't know how many bloody courses and lessons you actually have produced. I don't know either. No, you probably don't <laughs> want to know. Uh, um, if you could go back to the beginning what would be some of the advice that you would give? Because we we got an audience, I've got a company that we help e-learning entrepreneurs mm. build and set up membership e-education e on WordPress. What would be some of the things, some of the tips or insights you would give that early version um, from where you are now? Talk to people. Uh, they actually do uh, in-depth qualitative, qualitative research on what you're doing. Uh, by that, I mean go out and talk to the people that you're going to be training and figure out what they need. And when I say talk to them, I don't mean sit down, like talk to them over the phone or whatever. I mean watch them do their work. 
and see where they get stuck. And when you see them get stuck, find out why they're getting stuck. Like, is this a problem of I don't understand the interface, or is this a problem of I don't understand this entire concept? Um, and also observe when they're doing things that to you make no sense. Um, that could be like if you're talking in the WordPress world, it could be something like um, they're using a page instead of a post when they should be using a post, or it could be uh, they're using tags or categories in an odd way, or they're they keep like adding new blocks into the block editor when it seems like all these blocks are doing the same thing, um, and they're like using different blocks, and look at whether your reaction to it, your reaction of this is odd or wrong or whatever, is based on your personal opinion about this or whether it's actually wrong from the platform standpoint and whether that wrongness or oddness is caused by an inconsistency in the platform or poor communication from the platform or if it's a lack of understanding of the intent that the user is trying to meet or if it's that the user doesn't know what they're trying to do and they're just doing whatever feels comfortable or natural right because um what most of the information about how to do the basic things exists already. And there's little value in trying to reproduce existing information, right? Um, so if, uh, if you're a new WordPress developer or a new WordPress user, you're just like building a WordPress site, there is training materials out there that will teach you how to do that properly. And as a training person, I could go into that space and try to outcompete other people but you'd be competing against like LinkedIn learning, right? You'd be competing against the WordPress documentation team. The chance of you having great <laughs> success in that space is small because you're competing against behemoths, right? With millions of dollars of marketing or the actual platform training itself. Um, so then you have to say, what is it that I can do that they don't do? that I can build on top of? Or what is my specialty? Why would people come to me instead of these other platforms? And it's usually by having niche training, either in that you're providing training to a custom platform, right? So someone who has some sort of unusual setup for WordPress that needs specialty functionality. Or it could be that you're saying, okay, so all those people give generic training for like, you want to build a website. I give training on how to build a website for e-learning specifically. And we focus only on those features, right? And that also gives you the ability to say, I'm not going to do all the boring stuff. I'm not going to do all the, like, how to set up a WordPress site and set the site title. I'm going to let my users go watch that somewhere else. And then I'll focus only on the big things. And then you can charge more for it because you'll be like, you can get that other stuff anywhere. But you can only get this stuff here. And this is my specialty. And this is what I excel at, right? Right, that's great. Um, when I think something that's super interesting when people are thinking about like training and learning is like what platform or what to use, especially now that we have, I mean, Facebook rebranding as meta, the idea of the metaverse, the, the idea of VR, like is that going to completely eclipse me making videos? Like should I even start making e-learning videos now? and just like get onto this new <laughs> VR thing? Or no. like, like, where does that fit into all of this? So, so the VR thing, I think, is... <laughs> there was an article that came out right after the Meta announcement that was saying, I forget the title of it, but it was saying something like, Meta, or Meta is, the, is the promise that has not been met for the past 20 years, right? And yeah. it, you're old enough, both of you, to remember there was like in the early 90s, you could go to theme parks and they would have like VR rigs, right? Like this ring that you stood inside and you were playing some sort of shooting game where you had a gun and you had the glasses on and it was a really shitty experience, right? <laughs> and the only real difference between that and now is the high resolution and that you don't have like lag in the system. But you're still standing in that stupid ring. You still have the big ass headset on. Everything is the same. And... Anything that goes to like, like that fear of the lawnmower man, remember that movie, right? That that people would be in like these gyroscope. You haven't seen the lawnmower man? No, oh my the God. lawnmower man? The lawnmower man. You have to go watch the lawnmower <laughs> man. 
<laughs> you will be appalled at the graphics. But it's like the story <laughs> is the story is about how the scientist makes a VR rig and this um, 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 intellectually challenged person uh, who pushes a lawnmower is put into this rig and then he becomes like hyper intelligent. Right. And they're in like a gyroscope with haptic suits on. So, so all the concepts that they're talking about. Right. And then 80s graphics which are <laughs> really awful. Sounds incredible. <laughs> uh, absolutely worth watching. I'm sure you can find it for free somewhere online. But um, that was in like the late 80s, early 90s. And the only difference now, what, 30 years later, is that the graphics are better. <laughs> We're still in the same space. It's still just as shitty. So there's no, I wouldn't say there's an immediate risk um, of, you know, you making training videos today. They're just going to be phased out by some Facebook thing. However, um, there is a very real risk that uh, classroom teaching will be impacted by this in a very short period of time. Um, and the simple and the simple reason for that is classroom classroom instruction is very expensive, right? You have to build a building and you have to put people inside that building and you have to have teachers at the building and you have to have maintenance of the building and you have to have books and all that stuff. And um, enterprising companies will very quickly realize, hey, if we can like sell the school board on this idea that all the kids just put on glasses and they're in the virtual classroom and they have virtual books and they have a virtual teacher, then the teacher can teach like, hundreds of kids at the same time, right? And, and then just whoever pops up, they talk to. And for each of the students, it'll still feel like they're in a small room. It's just they don't realize the volume that's actually there because you can program that in. And the like end game there will be lower income students or students <laughs> in areas that have less money will be shunted over to yeah. a VR school. Whereas the rich kids get to go to an actual school, right? And there will be this massive class divide. And that will be fueled by companies giving the schools the headsets for free, right? And if you go read Ready Player One, that's basically what that book is about, right? How like this, the poor kids go to virtual school. This isn't like, this isn't me going like, oh, this is a terrible thing that might happen. This is the thing that will absolutely happen. Like, oh, 100% guarantee. Yeah. This will be offered within a year. Some no, they are, they're already will acting. They'll be offered. They're like, already acting. You can get they? these headsets for free. Put them on all your poor kids. They'll get a better experience. And then all of a sudden, the school boards will be like, "What?" Like, or the like conservative politicians will be like, "Oh, why are we spending all this money on school? We can do this cheaper this way." And then you'll have a class divide, right? The kids who have the privilege of actually meeting other human beings and the kids who don't. And it'll be very clear which kids get one and which kids get the other, right? Um, so. That is a real thing that will happen. But when you move into when you move into more advanced things like higher education, um, the interaction between like professor and student becomes very, very important, right? And for a lot of things, it becomes even more important because like you have all the profession studies like medical profession, dental, lawyer, lawyer, all these things will be very hard to move over. But if you're looking at something like sociology, you still have this significant human com component that you need like part of sociology is going out into the real world and talking to real people so, th so there's a bunch of these pieces that just can't translate well into these platforms when you come to the technical aspect of it what i've observed is when you're doing video training you're training a certain segment of your audience because the advanced technical audience doesn't want video training. They want text that they can just scan quickly, find what they're looking for, copy out the piece yeah. and put it in. Unless there's a specific thing they're dealing with, like an interface yeah. change that they need to visually see, which is why you get these hybrid articles that will have like text and then some video yeah. demo and then a code demo and then more text, right? And those things are very difficult to do. Like, Adding VR on top of that would not improve the experience. It would just be way more complicated, right? Yeah, and think... you're putting an added barrier in front of the learner. So I think they, um, for that type of thing, the hybrid model with text, videos, and code examples is the right way to go. It's yeah. also much easier to produce. So um, I'm interested in you saying about hybrid because there's a there's the concept of either online education or face to face there's one or the other mm -hmm. where i see the real benefit is a hybrid model which 
the Open University in the UK mm -hmm. um, since the 60s has been expert in where you do so much of the training at home through television, well, originally through television and radio, but now through the internet. But then you have weekend camps or yep. you have summer schools or you um, – and they try and build real community amongst the students and then they have these face-to-face -face meetings yep. um, between professors. And I think – I'm amazed at how many um, how that hasn't been moved on, and I really think that's a great concept. What was your feeling about that? Um, so there's this uh, pedagogical concept called flipping the classroom, which is that effectively. Um, the the idea of flipping the classroom is traditionally classroom teaching is you go into a classroom and then the teacher will impart on you knowledge, <laughs> and then you go home and you do homework. Flipping the classroom, the teacher will record the lecture and then the students watch the lecture at home and they come to school and then there's a discussion of the lecture or actual work around the lecture. And then the teacher becomes a resource for fielding the discussion or helping, you know, helping drive the discussion or help them actually figure out the problems. Right. That educational model works way better. <laughs> it's like flipping the classroom works way better. Why don't teachers do it? Because it's much more work, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. If you've ever been to a higher education institution, you will know that there are some teachers that are absolutely awful, right? And the reason why they're awful is usually because they're just running a script. So they've done yeah. the same lecture a thousand times. They're not willing to update it. Um, I remember when I was in university, I had a professor that would come in with a set of uh, overhead slides, right? Transparencies. And then the lecture would be him sitting there putting the slides on the overhead projector. And then he would fill in where the letters had been worn out from use and just read what was on the slide. And we would sit there being like, can you just Xerox copy these? And then we will not show up to class because this is an awful experience. We're just sitting here transcribing shit that you have used so many times that this the literal ink has come off your overhead. Right? This isn't education. This is, I don't know what this is, but it's definitely not education. Getting him to be like, oh no, I'm going to record my lecture and then actually interact with other human beings in class, that would never happen. So, so it requires like a culture shift in the teachers. And what you're seeing is younger instructors that are coming into education are more willing to do this because they are you know, taught on this model. But even they then get baked into this culture of it's easier to do it the other way. So, there, so there's, there's a lot of cultural shifts that need to happen, right? Um, if you go read Hendrik Ibsen, right? Like he wrote about this in the 1800s, how like the Latin school model was terrible. It took almost 100 years to get rid of that model, right? And like his books literally describe in detail how this is not an educational model that works, but it took a hundred years. It's the same now. It'll take a long time for schools to shift out of that model. But online education alone, like you said, is not necessarily a solution because you're missing this interactive component. So what I've seen students have really good success with is to make um, learning cohorts. Right. So you call them learning groups or reading groups or whatever you want. But literally, like go on the Internet and say, hey, so I want to learn JavaScript. Who else wants to learn JavaScript? And then you find a bunch of people who are at the same level as you. And because of the Internet, they can be anywhere in the world. Right. You just have to figure out time zones. And then you say, OK, um, this week we are going to work on um, object orientation. And then each person in the group can go watch a different course or read a different book or a chapter in a book. And then they all come together on a day, Friday, at the end of the week. And they say, OK, what have we all learned? And then they can all share their insights with each other, right? I tried this, and I found that really hard. Oh, but I wrote this other book, and that had a good explanation of this, but right? And then you share knowledge, and you don't all have to read every book. You can then, right? And you get to talk to other people about your challenges and your opportunities, and it becomes what you would get from a university setting. The, the challenge there is you need to find those people, right? And you have to actively cultivate a learning group so that it moves forward. But that is a way of working around the problem. Right. We're going to go 
We're going to end the podcast. We're going to have a quick bonus section, which you'll be able to listen to the whole interview on the WP Tonic YouTube channel. You can also watch it and please join the Facebook, the WP Tonic Facebook group, which is about e-learning, entrepreneur, building a membership site, getting going, basically. It's a great resource. So, Morton, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, what's the best way online to find that? You can find me on LinkedIn. My name is Morton Rand Hendrickson. Uh, should be <laughs> relatively easy to find. Uh, I'm also on Twitter, yelling at Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> at Morton, that's M-O-R and the number 10, more 10, because that's my name. Uh, and I'm on TikTok, oh, trashing <laughs> things and being cynical. Uh, at yeah. Morton Web. So any M-O-R-1-0 dance moves? Web. Not yet. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm a ballroom dancer. Ballroom dance does not translate well to. <laughs> right. So. Right. Um, Stephen, what's the best way for people to find out more about you? Uh, head over to hustlefish.com. Check out what we're working on. That's great. There won't be an interview next week, folks, because it's Thanksgiving and uh, I can't be bothered to try and find a guest, <laughs> uh, which is practically impossible. And I'm sure Stephen's traveling. Uh, um, so, but we'll be back the following week with another great guest. Like I say, I'm going to have a quick bonus section. I'm going to be asking um, Morton about IQ. Uh, um, that should be interesting. We'll be back next week. See you soon, folks. Bye. So, Morton, we're going into the bonus content a quick five, ten minutes, and I want a little bit of time to have a quick off, offline chat with you. Yeah. Um, so, IQ, it's very controversial. Um, I Basically, I think everything we discussed in the podcast part of the show, and I just want to give you a quick personal anecdote around yeah. this, is that um, I think my dyslexia, I think the real damage about my dyslexia experience was it demotivated me for quite a long time. And my parents, bless their hearts, they're both dead, were very decent people, but they were very from a working class background. Yeah. And so they provided no esper, no... Um, guidance or there wasn't in our house any exp- I'm, f- I'm struggling for the right word um, experts they expect ex- expectation of what you should achieve it was just mm-hmm. left um, so there was a lack of motivation personally and there was no driver behind it. And the school definitely didn't provide that mm. because it, um, it was a working class school and they didn't really expect much from the pupils anyway. Um, they were going to be factory fodder or whatever. Uh, um, so what I'm saying is does society motivates like if you're going to learn anything as a child as a young adult motivation and how motivation is produced in the individual isn't that the crux of all we learning all yeah. learning it's uh, i mean this is a big sociological conversation and political conversation about it would be. <laughs> how how society values training and who gets access to training and who gets access to education. Um, There are a lot of things that used to happen in society that don't happen anymore. Like there's a better understanding today than there was 30, 40 years ago around things like um, um, intrinsic skills, right? Like I, I, I always tell the story of how when my father went to high school, he had severe dyslexia and other learning disabilities too. Like he had a lot of challenges learning things. Um, and the school told him um, the only meaningful path for you is to be a carpenter, right? And it was something he was interested in, but it was not something he wanted to do as a profession. And well, he said, no, I want to go to medical school. And they're like, no, 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 right? no, 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 no. You cannot, like, this is a complete waste of time. Yeah. Uh, d- don't, under any circumstances, do that. And then he went to medical school. And he's a doctor and he has a PhD. Like, 
what what became very apparent to him when he went to medical school was that they didn't treat him like a learning disability. They treated him like a doctor, <laughs> right, in training. And that was the difference. It was literally like the frame that someone puts you in defines who you become, right? So if you're in the school environment, like it sounds like you were, where they say that if you have a certain property, then you are likely to go in a certain direction. And then they just like automatically. Push oh, it was worse than that because we are. Sorry, yeah, interrupt. It was actually worse because they had a uh, 90% of the children went to crappy schools mm -hmm. and through um, at the age, I think at seven or eight, 10% um, was sent to what in England is called grammar schools where mm -hmm. they got, the majority of the resources and 90% were just put into dustbin schools to be yeah. factory so, fodder. So you're, I don't know how old you are, but you look like you're like Thatcher kid, right? I'm a little bit older. So I, I love you, Walter. You can keep saying whatever you want. <laughs> so, so like you have to keep in mind historic, like you know this, but the people who watch this don't, right? So, Europe was decimated in World War II and spent 40 years rebuilding. And uh, in that period, you had shifts towards the far left, which right after the war, which was like, we need to rebuild together. If everyone works on their own thing, nothing will work. And then after things started working, you got a shift to the far right, right? And Thatcherism was the end result of that. And one of the things that um, was brought on by these ultra conservative governments was this idea that um, people build their own success, which is something that should be very, very familiar to Americans, right? This idea that you are a self-made person, that whatever befalls you is the, is the cause of your own ability to build, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, et cetera, et cetera, right? So in England, and by all means, correct me if I'm wrong here, but in England, there were at the time, or in Great Britain, there were areas that were extremely poor, uh, that were factory towns, that were like coal mining towns, that were things like that. And um, these kids that grew up in these areas were, sh were funneled into an educational system that just assumed that they would stay poor in these areas and keep feeding the factory towns, right? And then with Thatcherism got like a massive dismantling of the whole social safety net and everything. And it just got worse and worse and worse and worse. Kind you can of, go watch, you, you can go my, watch like Billy Elliot, right? Yeah. Go watch the, the, the yeah. ballet yeah, the, reason. You know, the movie production or whatever. Like that's yeah. the story. All these old movies from England about like how terrible things are. Yeah, are the reason I... Story. The reason I wanted to interrupt you there is that fundamentally you're correct. But no, in all honesty to you, it's just that even in these towns, what you've described, mm -hmm. if you pass this exam, most of them had a top tier grammar yeah, school. I know, but that's, and your that's life what I'm would be at. changed. It's just that's, that the majority. That's what I'm getting at. There's yeah. this. There's this notion that certain people are better than other people. And that you can test for that yeah. at an early age. And if you exactly. pass that test, you go into the higher level. And yeah. then you become a higher level society. And that the only thing that's holding people back from passing that test mm -hmm. is that they are not worthy, right? Yeah. The insane part about that is it's based on like a bell curve, right? Which is complete nonsense. So they're like, oh, only 10% of the population can pass this test. And therefore, if they don't, it's you know, it's through genetics or their own fault or they're not trying hard enough or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And you see this today too. Like there, um, you see these endless stories of how like, oh, look at this child who came from an inner city school in uh, downtown South Detroit, whatever. And, you know, this person was able to rise themselves up to become a Harvard graduate with like 800 PhDs at the age of 17. The only reason why all these other children around America don't do that is because they're not trying hard enough, right? Yeah. It's a complete travel, like it's a, it's a fabrication. It's a story society tells itself to justify poor education, right? To justify this idea of not investing in education. The reality is if you give any child, regardless of their situation, if you give them proper, well-funded education and support, they will be able to climb the, climb the social ladder. That means the social difference changes and becomes narrower 
which people don't want. People want to feel superior to other people, especially in a society that's built around a very self-centered focus, where it's like, I am a self-made person. And you see this in all these conversations, like when people say, you should, um, we, we should um, um, relieve all students of their student debt. And then you have people who are like, well, I had to pay my student debt, so why should they not have to? That's unfair. And it's like, that, what the hell kind of argument is this? This is an argument that I suffered, therefore other people must also suffer. That doesn't make any sense unless you're only thinking about yourself. Uh -huh. And the entire educational system is built around that. And this brings us to that question you had, right? The IQ question you didn't ask. Like, is IQ a good measure? IQ, that measurement, it has two purposes. So one is it's an actual medical measurement for like seeing how good people are at reasoning. And it can be used to measure um, cognitive skill in certain very specific so, um, um, clinical environments to find out like if you, if you crash your car and you take a CT scan of your head and you see there's a blip, you need to figure out like what was damaged. And then you put the, put the patient through like a barrage of cognitive tests to figure out like what was damaged here. What what and and if something was damaged, how do we work around the problem? Right, um, that is a legitimate use of it. But then, IQ becomes part of a much broader spectrum of tests that go on all sorts of things. And then you have the use, the common use of IQ, which is like a measure of worth in society, right? Which is like if you have a higher IQ, then you are better, right? which is ridiculous because you can train yourself to score high on the IQ tests. And the IQ tests test for a specific kind of thinking. It tests for very logical thinking, right? So I score very high on an IQ test. I'm not a very smart person. I just think that way, right? My brother scores way higher on the IQ test than I do because he has trained himself to do it, right? Like he finds these types yeah. of exercises very interesting. If you go into like a Mensa society, they will train you on how to get better IQ scores. Yeah, it doesn't I thought, mean you got smarter. It just means yeah. you got better at the test, yeah. right? I, I totally agree. I, I thought it was bad enough in the UK, and then I come to America. My God, they're, they're bonkers around testing, and I don't know what it is about American society, no, but they're, it's they're, not, they've it's just not lost American society. Just, they just it's lost a, the plot a long time ago. It's a need for metrics, right? Society is built around metrics. You need to be able to measure things. So you say like, okay, we invest money into education. We need to help measure the outcomes, right? And we've just gotten too obsessed with the metrics. That um, there was this very interesting thing that uh, was, um, there was an experiment that was done in higher education in uh, the Netherlands in the 80s and 90s, where they went and said, what if we, stop giving med students grades and instead just do bass fail, right? You're either a doctor or you're not. <laughs> There's no grade, right? And what they found was a very interesting phenomenon, which was the students in the pass fail group were far more collaborative than the students in the graded group because the pass fail group weren't competing against each other. And the other thing they found was all of a sudden the med school library had far less books taken out of the library. And they tried to figure out why the hell is that happening? Does that mean the students aren't reading the books? No. What was happening before was the students that were in this graded system who were competing against each other would go to the library early on in the year and take out the books so that the other students couldn't get them. And then they would just sit on the books so that they would have knowledge yeah. that wasn't available to the other happened. kids. You didn't bother me because right? I couldn't read the bloody book anyway, but I saw so other people doing it. Pure competition in the learning space for a profession that is literally life and death, right? And then they said, oh, we should do this with other things too. We should do it with like legal profession. We should have pass fail and then just set the bar really high, right? Because you have a bar exam. So it's easy to pass or fail. You already have that system in place. And the law students, which skew very heavily conservative, were extremely against this, not because it was reducing the quality of learning, but because they wanted to prove that they were better than other people. Right. So there's this competition thing in society that people just feel gratification at being able to prove they are better than other people. And if we let that kind of competition thinking become how we run society, then we end up where we are today, which is this extremely competitive thing where you have massive social stratification and no understanding of 
how the, that stratification happens. Like people, people at the top who have gotten to the top often through privilege do not understand that the people at the bottom can't magically climb that ladder unless well, we, they get uh, right? Thanks for that. We could go on forever. We need to end. I forgot to wear my uh, Karl Marx shirt for exactly. this, I realized. Donald Duck <laughs> yeah. is not quite well, the same. Well, you know, the classify, <laughs> I get loads of people saying, oh, I'm a communist. I just find it hilarious. Uh, um, we got to end it. Stephen needs to go off and make a living, and I need to have a quick <laughs> chat with Morton. Uh, um, we'll see you next week, folks. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.